Hello and welcome to Rap Party with Prime Video. This is a brand new podcast that celebrates the art and the artists behind the biggest and best films and TV shows. I'm Rihanna Dillon, I'm a film and TV critic, and with me throughout this series is my nerd in residence, Michael Leader. Hi, Michael. Hi, Rihanna. I'm just so thrilled to be referred to as a nerd in residence. That is <laughs> a career weird. peak right there. <laughs> you know, working as a film writer all these years, finally, nerd in residence. I should get you a badge. Oh, that'd be amazing. Yeah, Thank you. I'll do it. I'll do it for the next episode. <laughs> so, Michael, why did you want to make this show? So... You and I, we've been around the block a few times. We know that directors, producers, actors, they get all the limelight. They're there on the red carpets Mm -hmm. with cameras and microphones stuck in their faces as they say, oh, I couldn't do it without the whole team behind me, the whole cast and crew, they're the real heroes. Well, we're saluting those heroes with this very podcast, aren't we? Nice. That is so, so true. And I love that we're shining a spotlight on these people because they're so interesting. I always find them fascinating to listen to. Very excited that we get to speak to them. But why are we calling it Rap Party? So of course a rap party is the big bash at the end of a film production and we think might as well make our own fictional rap party, invite all the people we want to talk to and grab them for a metaphorical drink. All these people who we don't get to talk to, don't get to hear about the work they do, get to hear about it at length. And get sloshed while we're doing it? Mm, BYOB I guess. (laughs) So we are going to be having a little chat every single week about a specific craft and then we're going to be delving in depth to somebody's career from that craft. So this week we're going to be talking about costume design. So yes, this week's craft is costume design. Rihanna, you are a much more stylish person than I am, (laughs) so I'd like to ask you, what comes to mind when we say costume design? It's very cliche, but I think of massive period costume dresses, sort of like 17, 1800s. I think of Keira Knightley in The Duchess or even in Atonement. I think of beautiful fabrics. That is quite cliche, isn't it, actually? Now I, now I think about it. I think about all the frills. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a reason why they call those films costume pictures, right? Mm-hmm. But then you think about costume design as a craft. In some ways, it's maybe three different crafts within one. Mm-hmm. Certain awards-giving bodies have actually broken out into multiple categories for contemporary costume, sci-fi and fantasy costume, and then period costume of the kind with the frilly dresses that just mentioned. <laughs> and we do always tend to go for the big dresses, and maybe we tend to forget the contemporary, the sci-fi fantasy. Mm. Quick quiz, go Rihanna. On. So just as, a, just as an illustration <laughs> of this tendency towards period dress, yep. in the last couple of decades, the Oscar for Best Costume Design has tended to go to films in set historical periods in the past, mm-hmm. apart from two times. And I wonder whether you would be able to guess either of these films. They both would technically come under sci-fi and fantasy. Oh, I can give you clues if you'd like. Oh, okay. Um, I'm trying to think of big, epic scale films. So, sorry, they're modern day. One is set very much in the modern day. Mm -hmm. One is set in a dystopian future. I can't think of a single film. Like, now I'm put on the spot, I literally couldn't name you a single film. Is one, I don't know, maybe like a Chris Nolan film? No. So one is a Marvel (gasps) Cinematic Universe entry. Of course it is. Oh, uh, Black Panther. Mm -hmm. Yes. Beautiful costumes there. Beautiful. Ruth Carter is legendary for her costume design. I have to say that was a huge appeal to me for the movies. And the other one is actually, many people would say this is one of the greatest films of the 21st century so far. A post-apocalyptic thrill ride action film starring Charlize Theron and Tom Hardy. Oh, Mad Max. Oh, Fury Road. I mean, it was just like a lot of grubby bits of flimsy material, wasn't there? Yeah, exactly. Mainly belts, I think. Belts, a lot of belts. (laughs) (laughs) That's really interesting. And actually, speaking of belts, one of my favourite films for costume design, just in terms of how out there and weird it is, is Jean-Paul Gaultier's costume design in The Fifth Element. Mila Jovovich's white bandage outfit is so bizarre and cool. Like, that's a really, really iconic look. It feels like the iconic looks tend to come from sci-fi fantasy and period costume Mm. dramas, maybe. Can you think of any contemporary set iconic looks, maybe from recent films or TV? Do you know what? One is really springing to mind. I don't know if this is the look or just the person who wears this look, but Chris Evans in Knives Out, his really sexy cardies. He made the cardie cool again. Exactly. Yeah, well, now it's coming towards autumn, isn't it? 
Time to get the knitwear out. The cable knit. I feel like jewellery is so ostentatious a lot of the time with when you think about huge necklaces or tiaras or whatever. But normal people, Connell's Mm -hmm. chain. I mean, that literally like sparked its own (laughs) like Twitter account. That was something that people were talking about. I feel like... They were talking about that as a metaphor, Uh maybe for something else with Connell Mm -hmm. in Normal People. But that was the sort of breakout star yeah well you talk about breakout stars from tv series the jumpsuits in fleabag oh. flying off the shelves after that was <gasps> yes that's and episode still ahead. is like i went shopping last week and they actually had that exact well a knockoff of that jumpsuit and it is like you say it's iconic seeing phoebe waller bridge head to toe looking incredible do you think though that after watching a film or tv show where you say oh chris evans looked so great in that jumper or mm. cardigan would you want to go and wear that in the street? I was thinking of all those men that went out and got similar leather jackets to the one that is worn in Drive by Ryan Gosling. <laughs> no. Is that a good idea? <laughs> I can completely see what they're trying to do there. Who wouldn't want to look like Ryan Gosling? Or Chris Evans, come to that. I think sometimes it looks better on others. Sometimes it should just be left to the big screen. That's very diplomatically put. <laughs> And actually another contemporary dress that springs to mind is jeans because they're so everyday, right? And, you know, characters wear them pretty much in every period set them from like the 60s onwards. But I remember listening to a conversation with Sandy Powell, Oscar winning costume designer, and she was talking about how difficult jeans are to get right. Like out of all of the things that you have to design for an actor, jeans would not be the one that I would have thought caused the most issue. All of the incredible costumes that Sammy Powell has made over the years. That's the one thing. (laughs) The one thing that really stands out. I'm really, really desperate to find out if that's across the board Mm -hmm. or just Sandy's like specific hang up. Her Achilles heel. (laughs) (laughs) Well, luckily we have someone today who's done it all, really. We've talked about contemporary period and sci-fi fantasy. We have Claire Anderson, the costume designer today, who has done all sorts. I love Claire Anderson's work. Like I used to watch State of Play mm-hmm. back in the day. Like I was like 2003 and it had an incredible cast. It was this sort of series on the BBC where journalists and politicians butt heads and it had John Sim, mm-hmm. David Morrissey, a very young James McAvoy and Bill Nighy as well. I mean, who wouldn't want to dress one of the most dapper men in cinema, Bill Nighy? Well, she's dressed him twice as well. So one from the tie like that she's worked on is the Limehouse Golem, a bit of an underseen gem, I'd say. <laughs> a really gem. full, well, a really full-throated, gothic, lurid, horror mystery film from a few years ago with Bill Nighy as a detective tracking down almost the proto Jack the Ripper. Really something. Bill Nye can pull off pretty much any look as well, can't he? Like, he's good with a cable knit Mm -hmm. and a shirt and a tie and those oversized glasses. She's also worked on A Royal Night Out about the princesses Elizabeth and Margaret celebrating V-Day with The Great Unwashed. So, again, perfect era to portray on screen, I think. 40s, beautiful costumes, but also I really like that in the film that you see the richest family in the world dressing like normal people, which I think is really, really fun visually. And something that I'm really excited to talk to her about is Good Omens, yes. which I was a huge, huge fan of. So she designed the costumes. It's a Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett fantasy, if you don't know, starring Michael Sheen as the fastidious angel Aziraphale and David Tennant as the rather loose demon Crowley as they experience life on Earth pretty much from the beginning of time with support from the fabulous Miranda Richardson, who we're used to seeing dressed up as a queen mm-hmm. in in Blackadder, but she plays like this medium and courtesan, Madame Tracy. And also my favourite, Anathema, this character who is a practical occultist, which I think is just such a lovely, succinct way of talking about this woman who basically underpins the whole series. She's the one that's piecing everything together. That's what's fascinating about Claire's career is that she spent however long working in period and contemporary and now across two projects both adapted by Neil Gaiman is flourishing into fantasy. Yes. Another series she worked on was American Gods starring Ricky Whittle. What, the guy from Hollyoaks? Little Ricky Whittle made good, <laughs> yeah. Amazing. As a man who becomes embroiled in this conflict between new gods and old gods so Claire has to come up with costumes to suit a sort of modern day grounded version of Odin of the Ghanaian god Anansi as well as modern day 21st century gods like personifications of 
technology, the media, globalization. So it's fascinating to go from state of play, very much an office bound yeah. real world setting to something where you have the most extraordinary characters walking around the corner. We're going to be talking to her about pretty much every inch of this fabulous career that she's had. So it's probably time to welcome her to Rap Party. Here is Claire Anderson. Claire, thank you so much for talking with us today. I suppose a big question to begin with, costume design, particularly when where the Emmys are concerned, divided up into three subcategories, sci-fi, fantasy, period, contemporary. Is that a fair way of cutting it? Are they different disciplines almost? They are different disciplines, but who really understands the dark arts of the award ceremonies? <laughs> Do you approach a more contemporary setting versus one that has fantasy and sci-fi elements differently? I suppose you just read the script and then you start collecting visual imagery and I don't really think about it beyond that. I mean, until I did uh, Good Omens, fantasy and sci-fi was not a realm I entered into in my literary tastes. I'm much more Austin or Balzac, really. And, you know, so it was really interesting and I find Hope actually quite hard to read, I suppose, and or the Neil Gaiman much easier. And I found a very good way to absorb the first part of the Good Omens was to listen to the talking book. And so that was a hugely easy way to absorb all the information. And then while you're listening to that, you're just tinkering away, pulling up images, thinking, oh, what does that make me think of? The moments you're not lounging on the sofa, sort of in a drifting <laughs> off into that world. But it, that was a really brilliant way. And of course, on the page, you have to go back to the book to reference things, to highlight the bits you want to go back to and research. And you start then doing a bit of research and Wikipedia, Google, the world is your oyster. You don't really even have to leave the house, fortunately, in these times right now. So you costume design for State of Play, which yes. I absolutely loved when watching when I was younger. I was such a huge fan, especially of John Sim and then James McAvoy and Bill Nye. It had an incredible cast. But I was wondering from your perspective, when you're dressing something that is present day, how do you dress it so that it remains very much in the moment but also doesn't necessarily date? You can I can go back and watch State of Play and it doesn't feel incredibly dated just by the look of it. That's so fabulously generous of you to say because <laughs> to get a timelessness that doesn't make something date is something that I learned from watching other television programmes and having, I think such a distaste for 1980s clothing <laughs> um, because I was at art college at that time and really wasn't in the nine to five working day. Yeah. I really didn't like all that shiny self-print fabric. So uh, to make State of Play very timeless was part of my pitch when I went to meet Hilary Bevan Jones, the producer, and David Yates, the director. All first five episodes were brilliantly written. We waited a really long time for episode six. Really? And for a long time, I wasn't really sure quite who had done what and what was really going to be the outcome. So it was a brilliant job to do. And I think you just dissect each character. You look at the semiotics of what you want them visually to translate to your audience. Um, I'd worked with John Sim on Human Traffic, which is another almost um, caricature, single visual identity type mm. look, because that whole film is 90 minutes of almost one costume per character. And so I think uh, stage play was different because I actually had to have story days and consider a passage of time. Mm -hmm. But it, you're looking at what makes something timeless, really, mm. not to date. Yeah. Well, I mean, with human traffic, it's almost the complete opposite because it is so a time capsule, isn't it? I mean, that must be quite a weird pressure where you have to pick out one, like you say, one specific outfit per person. It just comes to you. I don't know how. You just read it. So you're a genius. And, and, uh, <laughs> that's really kind and not in the least bit true. But I think you just start reading and you know. So... Human Traffic was such a very low budget piece and somebody sent it to me and I hadn't come through my agent and I said, oh, this is coming. And she said, well, read it and see. I got to page four and I rang and said, this is a seminal piece. I just felt it wasn't particularly my world of culture, but I got it and I totally, I was a little bit older. In fact, I was probably one of the oldest people on the shoot and I had to have it explained to me that they were wearing contact lenses to give them dilated pupils because that's what taking ecstasy did to you. <laughs> and I was completely, oh, right, that's really <laughs> fascinating. But I got that that was a really valuable 
story to tell and the same with stage to play the political part of it and you just decode the people and you apply all of those rules of semiotics to things. Mm. So when you're reading the script, say, by page four of Human Traffic, you knew it was a project you wanted to work on. What is it that you look for in a project that gets you interested? Well, something that gets me off page one. <laughs> it's, like when you, it's like when you start reading a book. I mean, I don't like starting something and not finishing it, <laughs> but you can get a couple of pages in and think, Ugh, turgid. And I think, well, what normally puts me off is... OK, there's been an accident, the police are called and she's already in a hospital. So that by page three means I don't want to do it because I don't want to do police uniforms and I don't want to do hospital staff uniforms. The decoding of a, everybody wears their uniform differently, naturally, but they're more rigorous in the police and there's less creative freedom for somebody to express perhaps how they clip their radio on isn't quite as buzzy <laughs> as doing good omens where the world is your oyster. <laughs> I think it's a really nice time to move on to Good Omens because there is just so much to talk about in this one series. There, I love that you're making a face. There is, because we have so many reinventions, but it's all set in... Yeah, it goes from the beginning of time to potentially the end <laughs> yeah. of time. I do remember thinking, I don't think I really fully understand this. It's quite big, isn't it? But the biggest costume madness is in episode three. And once that's edited down beautifully by the amazing script writer and novelist Neil Gaiman, you realise you've got a very manageable, bite-sized portion of history that is relatable to a painting or a photograph or an iconic image. And what you want to do is make your project relatable to an audience. So you're looking for the common denominator that means it's easily interpreted. Mm. So out of all of those periods that we see Michael Sheen and David Tennant go into, which was your favourite to research? We honestly had to do that so quickly really? be because of the screen time. The bit I love the most mm -hmm. is when we shot at the Globe and that's because my assistant designer did that. She went and hired beautiful period costumes in the colours and tones we'd set that were appropriate for Aziraphale and Crowley and that worked for their characters. But she pulled it together and she arrived back with fitting photographs and it was beautiful and it worked with everything that I would like it to be without my having to go and wrangle all of the corsetry and nightmare and lacing <laughs> of, of that period of clothing. And I really loved how that piece was written because obviously to fill an auditorium with the whole crowd would have been just days and days of work to set it up and fit it and blah. So it was wonderful that they, you know, it was a very unpopular piece and uh, that Shakespeare is asking for Crowley and Aziraphale's advice. <laughs> but Bobby Edwards, my amazing assistant designer, did that and it was beautiful. It was lovely to look at a part that was beautiful and work to what we decided the tone and the palette of each of the cast were and she just rolled with it we were lucky to get those authentic beautiful pieces because the globe make everything more or less as periodly appropriately as they can and I have great deal of respect for that but not enough patience to probably have done that <laughs> something I find so impressive about good omens and also American gods to a certain extent is that the costumes situate extraordinary characters in the real world that's around them, admittedly stylized by the vision of the filmmakers. But to focus on Azraphael and Crowley, they do look like extraordinary beings that could walk around the corner today. Mm -hmm. to Michael a Sheen extent. said, who played Azraphael, he has to look like he could not look too out of place in Soho now. <laughs> And it was about finding the right cut of, I suppose because they'd gone from the beginning of time through mm -hmm. to the end of time, they, both David and Michael, looked at what they liked for their characters. So we had mood boards and tone suggestions and they came and we sat down and talked about things. We had sort of a rail of clothes and slip things on. I like a bit of this. I like a bit of that. How does that work with that? And Michael said he has to feel plausible now he but he needs to have an air of something from a time ago and I think his character settled somewhere around 1850 1880 mm -hmm. somewhere in that <laughs> and David slinked around the dressing room in various <laughs> things looking amazing and slightly is snake-hipped and delightful and 
just Keith Richards himself into something. <laughs> he didn't, it wasn't intended that he looked like Keith Richards. That really was an analogy of another journalist much later, but it is quite appropriate. <laughs> but also, like, Aziraphale's neckwear is such a brilliant, like, evolution of his character all the way through. Can you talk a little bit about how you kept that one little theme that I think for fans is so huge, but... The tartan. Yeah. Well, we had to design a tartan that would work because tartan is copyrighted, so we would have had to pay quite a lot of money to get clearance on something. So we looked at... Um, our director Scottish and Neil Gaiman has McKinnon in his name, so Douglas McKinnon and Anderson Tartans. That's you, yeah. Came in together and we got a textile designer to mix these pieces of these colours and merge them and make a repeat pattern for us that we got printed up digitally in slightly different colourways, in slightly different scales. And we made a cravat, we made... When Aziraphale plays the Mr A Fell, the amazing magician, we actually didn't have quite enough of one tartan to make a flouncy enough bow. We're in a fitting and he's like, mm, it could be a bit bigger. And I'm thinking, it can't be, we don't have enough tartan. <laughs> what are we going to do? So uh, what we did was we backed it with a different colourway. He said, actually, I rather like that, that's great fun. It just all evolved. They were incredibly generous. Generous. They were incredibly interested in what they looked like and had an enormous amount to invest in, in their characters and their physicality and their visual identity was incredibly important to them. Was there like a, a one like, oh my God, moment where they walked into the dressing room to see what they'd be wearing? Was there one particular costume that blew them away? We just knew it was right when they put it on and they felt right. It was a very gradual process of mm. over six weeks of fittings and chattings and photographs and collating information and not in the least bit pressurised, I have to be honest. It was incredibly the most genial conversation between all of us with Neil, who's very conversational and extremely good fun, and Douglas, who's also got all of those delightful qualities. So it was a very easy nonchalant mm. Mm, yeah yeah it was great when I saw the first press photos I felt a bit sick because I thought oh god is this right is this right this book's got such a huge fan base this is massive this is massive have have we got it right but really the people who enjoyed the book really did seem to feel they identified with it absolutely absolutely yes. we've spoken so much about having Michael and David being part of this process of discovery for discovering their characters however we did also talk about the process beginning with you reading the script or listening to the audiobook and the ideas coming from the ether how much is it something that you develop yourself these designs and how much is it something you develop in collaboration with everybody else it's a real balance some people are very happy for you to arrive and give them you know nowadays you can easily email a mood board mm. a pdf of some beautiful photographs and visuals put together with some colors they can send a scan back and a set of measures you can get the tailor off to start which is handy actually at the moment because getting a tailor to start and, and then have lesser fittings, perhaps two fittings rather than five, all works in a pandemic. So you have to start with something. You have to present your artist with a bigger idea. And that first pitch is the pitch you do when you read the script and you go and meet the director and the producer or the showrunner. And then a few more people get involved and then your agent rings and says, oh, they might not, they're quite fancy chatting to you again or are you available to go and have a look at this? Or So it sort of builds from there and that's really what happened. I had a quite broad range of ideas within a conversation visually and then it just went from there. It was easy. I don't know why, it just fell off the page. <laughs> But Neil writes like that. So the script was maybe even more like that than the novel, but the novel was always there to go back to. Could you please just, I know this is a podcast, so we can't really see this visually, but what a mood board actually looks like. I've seen costume design mood boards that could be made up of sketches. I've seen them with fabrics, clippings. What does yours look like, particularly maybe for a good omens? Yeah, it is all of that. And you do that, I think, particularly for each character when you're a bit further down the line. But for my first meeting, I did something which I don't very often do. And it was a very long mood board because I read each scenario in the script and I put my visual interpretation of that, either one photograph or a series of paintings and photographs and images, some fashion, some fine art, some social documented type photography and told the whole story visually all the way through so that 
you could see the journey, you could see the Renaissance paintings of religion, or you could see uh, older people. There was no Instagram in mm. you know, whenever they were crucifying Jesus. So <laughs> it, I had to go somewhere and I went to the Renaissance because the colours were good and there's a bit of gold in there and I like that. <laughs> so that's how I did it to start with. And I very often do that now. And and then I have got a whole story to send an actor and they can then feel where their character fits in. And I, I often feel that's a very good way to help an actor see their part in a bigger picture. How accurate do you like to be? Like, If something is set in the Victorian era, for example, and we might all associate something with the Victorian era, actually it might have been just a bit after when the film or TV series is set, would you still use that even if it hadn't necessarily been invented by then? It depends on each project and every director or set of execs or DOP might ask for something different. So very often big bonnets aren't favoured because they're very difficult to light mm -hmm. or but you want to have a head covering because it's period appropriate. And very uh, cusps of eras are quite difficult. So I'm looking at something now which is set in 1962. Well, 1962 is still very 50s, really, mm -hmm. but you need to give your audience a little morsel yes. of something to know that they're in the 60s. So... Yes, you visually cheat sometimes a little bit to draw your audience's eye or their emotion to where you want them to be. We are not historians. We do art history, but you're telling a story and you want to give your audience the right idea. So there's a bit of creative license. We've spoken so far mainly about designing costumes for men. And this is a very kind of big broad question is it more fun designing for a female or male character oh it depends on the individual men because good omens is david and michael as the lead but i absolutely adored madame tracy's costume and mm. um anathema and the coat that i did from anathema i'm still dining out on the fabric that we found to make that <laughs> plaid a mohair coat i'm still very in favor with that fabric mill in yorkshire yeah. yes. <laughs> good <laughs> A period that I wanted to talk to you about was for the film A Royal Night Out. Oh, and, yeah. You know, visually it's such a fun... F I mean, you basically did the crown before the crown, right? Like you were dressing a young queen <laughs> and, I mean, it's a very specific era. So is that really, really fun to go back and revisit? Because presumably yeah. there was a lot of visuals that you can turn to in terms of research. Well, I also did that storyboard all the way through, but I used kissing as my my visual key all the way through that because it was really that night where there was such euphoria yeah. and I read a lot about it and uh, there's an elderly lady who lives on my street who must have been 14 on VE night and she'd gone to Trafalgar Square yeah. so her stories were really interesting and so I read a little bit of the real story a little bit of my neighbour's information mm -hmm. I think she might have padded it out a bit <laughs> but it was very good to listen to and then I had an amazing costume team and the costume hire company Angels were absolutely fabulous because nobody else was um, hiring 1940s there was no other 1940s films going at that moment so we had full access to the best stuff and amazing. I had really lovely people working with me pulling a, together the most amazing books. I mean we had a huge crowd and we filmed outside Buckingham Palace which you know as a young I mean I was a bit young than and I just had felt I totally arrived to have my costume trailer on the mall. I just thought, wow, I used to see this when I worked in theatre. <laughs> this is it. I've arrived. And then we had to wash all the socks at the end of the night and I oh realised it was still a job. <laughs> <laughs> is like dressing the character of the Queen a sort of another level than just dressing? Because, you know, she's, for this country especially, you know, very iconic. Um, uh, there's lots of historic factual information for anything that's to do with uniforms, which I'm very keen to hand over to someone with mm. a much more applied eye for that kind of thing. My response to something is much more emotional than factual, so I'm not really to be trusted with a badge um, <laughs> or anything, any pips or anything like that. I have to be seriously watched. Uh, even RAF or Army, I might get confused, to be honest with you. So I was very lucky to have a very good support team there. <laughs> but it's just a story and it was a it was a spoof ball romantic comedy mm. in the style of a 1950s or 40s romance like that so it was such fun to do across this series we're talking about craftspeople behind the scenes people from all different disciplines and some of them the actual job they do has changed or maybe didn't even exist 10 years ago 
And I wonder, just talking about the research process and how the actual tactility of it all, it feels like costume design maybe has always been the same, maybe even going back to theatre, or has there been anything that's changed, maybe even in your career, that's different? I think what's changed in my career is that I've attracted bigger budget jobs, so I get to do more of the research and I get more support. Whereas when you very first start, you are at the twin tub at the end of the night, you are washing the socks, whereas now I'm very lucky that I've usually got, sometimes we have a swing laundry team in to look after the bigger crowds. I'm not very as involved with the day-to-day running of Mm -hmm. the shoot, and that's a luxury. Although I'm often on set establishing a new costume, etc., but... I'm not as involved with the nitty gritty and I'm not polishing the shoes anymore or not very often. (laughs) But I suppose the essential job is the same as it would have been on a film production 50 years ago. Yeah, Yeah. essentially, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. It hasn't changed a great deal. And so we're also interested in asking our interviewees about what gave them the bug for the craft they now perform. So costume design, at what point did you think film, TV, costume design was something I'd like to do? I met a man in a cafe (laughs) <laughs> and I had worked in theatre. I have a BA and a postgrad in printed textile design and I sold designs through my degree course to Miss Sony, Dior, Yves Saint Laurent. So I saw a job advertised for the theatre, the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden, to rejoin the Dying and Breaking Down department. And they were quite interested in me because I had a printed textile background and they often needed a short run for a cloak. And they thought I would be good for that. So I took that job. And then from there I went and did my postgrad at Central St Martins and worked part-time at Covent Garden so I could walk between the two. And that was perfect. Got to the end of that and someone said, oh... They need someone to go on this project to do some dying and breaking down. I think that's what I thought I wanted to do. I'd seen Derek Jarman's Miranda, and there's a cloak in that, which was sublime, and I thought, I'm going to be the person that paints Miranda's cloak. Anyway, I went to Ireland, put the mud on the boots, the blood on the wounds. It was great. I liked it, and I found that I was physically exhausted and mentally exhausted by the end of the day because it had used my brain in in a bigger way than perhaps other things had and so I came back and I was a bit lost for what to do we'd set up a small workshop in South London with someone who left English National Opera so we had a merge of contacts and we we did some set painting on silk for a poetry festival we did all sorts of really amazingly creatively interesting things but I I was just a bit hungover one Sunday morning and I was sitting at the Royal Festival Hall and a man who I now know to be Matthew Littleford sat next to me and he's now a very senior executive producer at ITV. We were both reading the paper and he said to me, oh, blah, blah, chat, chat, what do you do? And he said, well, do you know, that's quite interesting. We're looking for a costume designer for a series of short dramas we're doing for a chat show called Dear Dilemma. So we did little 15-minute dramas of a teenager crying about a heartbreak. or, And so we shot all of those, 24 of those, in one very small house in the Docklands over a summer. And I just thought, wow, I totally <laughs> arrived. I love it. I love taking the laundry home at the end of the night and putting it in the machine and taking it back the next day. And then somebody who'd worked with me on that said, oh, actually, they're really looking for someone to work on Brookside. And I didn't have a television growing up, but we got a television when when North Yorkshire, where I'm from, got um, Channel 4. <laughs> and I can remember Brookside starting. I mean, and I was absolutely beside myself. They paid for me to go there on the train. They put me in a hotel. I got my lunch at work. I mean, all these things were just amazing. If you've been a student for a long time, those things were really <laughs> ticked a lot of boxes. And I absolutely loved it. We shot 18 minutes a day. It was furiously fast. The The Brookside cast were fabulous, generous, lovely people. Liverpool's a great place to be, and I learned a tremendous amount. And I don't quite know what happened after that, but I just never stopped. <laughs> That was the best. I was not envisioning Brookside coming into that. Um, is there like one particular accessory, like you're a kid in a candy shop where you're like, I can just pick any necklace I want or any earrings, any handbags. Is there one accessory that you really love? A little bit with some characters, quite a lot of characters, you start with the shoes because you want to see how they walk. You want to know how their physicality will impact on their presentation of their character. Mm -hmm. So I suppose shoes are really important. But that might ever so slightly be because shoes are important to me. Yeah. Or they were before I got too old to walk in high heels. <laughs> <laughs> this might be a bit of a dead end question, but how product designers always want to try and reinvent the chair. Every actor of a certain age wants to do their Hamlet. 
is there a certain piece of costume and a period, a character type that every costume designer wants to have a crack at? Yeah, I don't know. I don't want to do anything futuristic or I find that really difficult. And I don't really want to do the 90s very much because it's so close in my living memory unless the script is right, I find quite a lot of it ugly or difficult to digest and I find it, that's not my natural habitat. I like a bit of historical reference. That was what was good fun about Royal Night Out, that there was actuality to it. And state of play, I had real people to refer to in contemporary politics, but, I, you know, keeping the breadth a little wider so you got a timelessness to it. And Good Omens is pretty much based in mythicism and factual nonsense if you like if there's such a thing that it's all relatable you can read a little bit about where that idea came from which I find really helpful but the future mm -hmm. we don't know about that yet and I don't think my imagination's quite big enough I don't think I could do Star Trek <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we've acknowledged that the 90s was a very ugly era though <laughs> well it's only ugly now there's a costume historian called James Laver who says that 10 years ago is ugly right. 20 years ago is quite ugly but the 60s was dreamy and that's that only because it's so long ago now we've got a romantic notion of all that polyester yeah. <laughs> One thing that I've heard a lot of costume designers talk about, including Sandy Powell, actually, saying that jeans are the hardest piece of costume to get accurate to an actor. Oh, yeah, it's so interesting. I just was talking to my assistant designer on my 60s job about that, and we do have to get jeans for the young heartthrob James Deeney type mm -hmm. character. And I do know that that will be really tough. And I thought, oh, the classic Levi. You know, yeah, the Uniqlo salvage seam is good. Then there's the all the eco denim people, their cut is really good. And actually, do you want something on the pocket or do you not want something on the pocket? And buying jeans for yourself is difficult. Mm -hmm. Buying a bra is really difficult. Yeah. Getting corsetry right for somebody, it can be quite hard as well. But jeans are tough. Each person's different. We're all flawed. Maybe the back of your knees is just your weakest point and you don't ever want to show anybody them. You know, I'm dealing with all of the actors' demons mm. and it's not always the back of their knees that they don't like. Which department do you end up working the closest with that isn't the director because I would assume hair and makeup but uh, it can be it depends on the individual and what the piece is like if there's lots of special effect makeup then sometimes that very much leads the look of the character and you're working more closely with them because that has to work with their visual identity that is part of their visual identity very often it's the production designer mm. so initially it's the production designer and you're working really closely where does that person inhabit where have they come from what's around them and some directors on contemporary pieces get an actor in a workshop situation to put a box together of all the things they might have in their home or in their immediate surroundings and that's a production design sort of tool that I would Mm, I want to look in the box and see what feeds me. And then a bit later down the line, it's the DOP for the lighting and to find out fabrics and how things light and how you're going to make something magical. <laughs> you're talking about taking inspiration from maybe the box of personal affects yeah. there, but where does inspiration come from for you when it's not the specific project you're working on? What are you looking at? Are you even looking at what other costume designers are doing and oh, drawing yeah, inspiration so from them? You're feeding all the time, aren't mm -hmm. you? That's what's been difficult about lockdown. Well, except, thank goodness, for the internet if this had been 30 years ago it would have been a much duller experience <laughs> but the world's in there you can see every exhibition online and mm. access all sorts of great archive material because I started in fashion mm -hmm. I think I'm very interested in what that was always I was working a couple of years ahead because I was working in the textiles which make the garments so you're always looking ahead to find out what will feed the next trend or mm -hmm. what's influencing society politics is quite interesting social trends are really important mm -hmm. you're just going around greedily watching absorbing my dad can't get why I can sit in a cafe all day and just watch people <laughs> walk, walk past. But you're feeding, aren't you? Mm. It really is one of the great observational arts in a way. Mm. Yeah. But do you ever find yourself looking at films for inspiration, maybe old films? Yeah, very often a director will say these are things we've taken a lead from. Mm -hmm. Where I grew up in North Yorkshire, there was no cinema and we didn't have a television. So I'm very much, it was the radio and books. And I can remember sitting in the middle of a broadsheet newspaper to read the newspaper when I was too little to hold it. <laughs> so reading about Edward Heath losing the election and crying. So we didn't have masses of visual information around us. But there were stately homes and there mm. were 
not in my family, but to visit (laughs) as landmark trust type places. So it was interesting. Those sort of things feed you and history and experiences stay with you. Like going to look round the Isle of Wight house, Queen Victoria's house there. I mean, I'd wanted to do that. My parents had a book on Queen Victoria and we were allowed to vote where we would go on holiday. And I wanted to go to that house. I just was absolute. And we went to that house and I thought it was just amazing. But that is something that impresses me so much because it is a talent and a skill I don't have. I'm somebody who lives almost purely within the world of films. But somebody like a costume designer, production designer can look out into the world and take inspiration from that. So I love to watch a film and I love well-written TV drama. So I'm absorbing stuff all the time, but I, I'm honestly fickle. Sometimes if I'm starting to research something, I actually won't go to an exhibition or I won't listen to anything, a radio drama, that isn't set in the right period mm. because I find it confusing. So I'm all about the 60s at the moment. We're creating this fictional rap party. You're invited. Thanks. If you could invite somebody else as your plus one, could be from any point in history, could be any role in the crew, who would you invite? I thought about this and I was trying to talk to my husband about it and he said, well, he would take me, obviously. So that wasn't the best creative (laughs) inspiration for that conversation. (laughs) I wondered uh, that I might invite Mr Nancy in all his guises. Orlando Jones, who is absolutely charming and fabulous company. So if I could have Mr Nancy or a Nancy in all his guises, that would be who I'd like to be with. I might take the script editor from Good Omens with me, Jemima Thomas, (laughs) just because she got me through some tough moments when you're just oh, okay, we're in the desert and we need that right now. And she's always got an amazing bag of tricks with her and she's great company. I love my crowd supervisor, Nikki Connor. The DOP was wonderful. I'm sure we can stretch to a plus five. (laughs) (laughs) I I mean, I'm not very good at a rap party, to be honest. I like to get home and get to bed. (laughs) Once you've kicked your high heels off. Yeah, and trainers these days. (laughs) (laughs) Or some Gucci flats. Claire Anderson, thank you so much for joining us at the rap party. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, that was an amazing chat. Thank you so much to Claire Anderson for joining us today. Yeah, I loved learning about the genes. I had to get that question in. I'm glad you answered it. Also, just hearing about Michael Sheen and David Tennant as those incredible characters in Good Omens. But also, her shoe addiction. Mm -hmm. I am a big fan of how open she was about expensive shoes. I feel so much more educated about costume (laughs) design. I might even try and redress my wardrobe a little bit after this. Who knows? Maybe it'll all go wrong. Calm down, Michael. Don't do it. (laughs) We talked about all sorts of series and films, so if you'd like to catch up, you can see Good Omens, American Gods and Limehouse Gollum. They're currently available all to watch on Prime Video. So if you head to the show notes of this episode, you can find links to watch all of those, as well as other things that Claire mentioned, like A Raw Night Out and State of Play, my fave. And the talking book of Neil Gaiman. <laughs> I love the fact that she called them talking Me books. Too. The, the audio books of Neil Gaiman's work <laughs> and the relaxing Edith Wharton books like The Age of Innocence and The House of Murder. I have well. Edith Wharton downloaded, oh, actually. Yeah. Yes, they're very soothing. So what a start to our rap party. That was a lot of fun. 100% agree with you, Rihanna, and we'll be bringing more people along every week for the next couple of months, and we can't wait to talk to them. Rap Party with Prime Video is a Little Dot Studios production for Prime Video. The show is hosted by Rihanna Dillon and Michael Leader. It's produced by Annie Hughes, Jake Cunningham and Harold McShiel, with additional research from Nicole Davis. Our original music is by Axel Cacoutier. We're edited by Content is Queen. Thanks, guys. And our artwork is by Sandra Boucher. And if you've enjoyed the show, you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. See you at the party. Bye. Bye.